Hello, welcome to Nautilus Live. My name is Jamie Zachariah and I am the Digital Media Specialist with the Ocean Exploration Trust and we are coming to you live from onboard EV Nautilus. Today is the second in a series of panels for our From Shore to the Abyss program in partnership with National Geographic Society. And this program is really special because we're combining our expedition expertise with scientists around the world um, for both shallow and deep water research so that we can come together for global ocean conservation. Um, Wherever you're joining from, whether it's Facebook or LinkedIn or YouTube, don't forget that you can submit questions for our panelists for later on in the show. Um, we'd also love to hear where you're tuning in from, so let us know in the comments. This panel is focusing on one of the five research teams that are joining us for this year's From Shore to the, From Shore to the Abyss program. And this research team is focused on marine mammal communications and acoustic underwater soundscapes. So we'll be learning all about an ocean of sound, what underwater noise is, how it impacts marine mammals, marine life and reef health here in the Hawaiian waters. And to kick it off, I'd like to introduce Carissa Cabrera, who is the founder of the Conservationist Collective and the expedition member of our marine mammal team. Carissa, can you tell us about marine conservation and communication? Yeah, thank you so much, Jamie. It's great to be here. Um, I'm joining all, you aboard the Nautilus as well as part of these expeditions, collaboratively led by Ocean Exploration Trust and National Geographic Society. I am leading the education and outreach effort for the marine mammal team. So I'm really excited to be here because I am welcoming several of our other marine mammal teammates to share about the project. Marine mammals are obviously charismatic and intriguing, and I really am excited to have this time with you all to dive deep into the science with a lot of our team members. So first, we are going to be getting with Matthias Hoffman-Kuhn, who is a senior research fellow with the National University of Singapore and our fearless leader on the marine mammal team. Um, he's also a National Geographic Society fellow and explorer and has been spearheading bioacoustics research in Southeast Asia. We have already had a few exciting field days aboard the expedition so far. So let's learn a little bit more about what research questions we're trying to answer here. Hey, Matthias. Hi there. So yeah, we are starting off with two projects really, or two parts of the project that we have here. Um, one is looking at uh, communication between marine mammals, and the other one is just recording general soundscape data underwater. Now, why is that important? Well, um, what light is in air is sound underwater. Sound can travel for thousands of kilometers if the frequencies are low. So we, we're really using this underwater. The animals are using this to uh, communicate, to find food, to navigate. And so it's, it's the most important sense for them, really, because light ends after about 50 meters. You can't see any further than that. Um, and sound can travel very, very far. Um, so the first part of that, really of the project is to record animals. And this has been done before, of course, you know, people have done uh, cameras uh, with a microphone and recorded animals. But the problem is that you cannot identify uh, where the sound's coming from. So if you have a group of animals, uh, you might hear lots of sounds, lots of whistles and clicks and squawks and all that, but you have no idea who was just whistling. Uh, this has to do with the fact that speed of sound underwater is about four and a half times as fast as it is in air. And our brain just cannot process that, and there's other problems with it. So we just can't do it. It's not, we're not made for that environment. And so in order to do that, we have developed a system that allows us to pinpoint the location of sound. This is very important because if you want to understand the behavior of these animals, what we need to do is identify where the sound's coming from. It's like watching a silent movie. If you're just watching the silent movie, you, you, you see they're talking to each other and doing something, but you don't know what exactly is happening. Um, so if we can identify where the sound is coming from, then we know this animal um, was vocalizing first, and then this one responded to the time. So if Apologies for the delay. We are experiencing a few technical difficulties, but we're back. So let's turn it back to Carissa and the marine mammal team. Yeah, thanks everyone for your patience. You never know what could happen when you're on a ship in the ocean. So um, right before we cut off, I had just introduced our fearless leader, Matthias um, hoffman Kuhn, and he was describing the importance of ocean soundscape and giving a little bit of examples as well. So Matthias, could you tell us a little bit about why the research we're doing aboard the Nautilus is so important for marine mammals? Well, what, we've, um, what we know is that the marine mammals use sound to communicate, to find food, and to just navigate in the open ocean and over long distances. So sometimes over thousands of kilometers, if you look at the larger whales like blue whales and fin whales. 
Um, but the same goes for smaller cetaceans like dolphins, right? So they need to use acoustics all the time. And it's really something that, that runs their lives. And if we understand a little bit more on how they do that and how they communicate and particularly who is talking, if we do that, then we can possibly figure out what exactly uh, is happening and we can learn from the behavior and learn from their actions and see um, how, they, how their social structure works and who, what they may be talking about. And hopefully in the future, we'll be able to talk to them directly. So in order to do that, um, we need a system that not just records what's there, that's been done before. So you have a camera and you have uh, a microphone underwater and you, you can swim with that and you, know, you can do it with a GoPro if you want. Um, so very easy to do uh, in theory. But the problem with that is that you don't know where the sound's coming from. And since sound speed is about four and a half times as fast underwater than it is in air, we cannot locate sound sources underwater. We, we're in the water, you know, the sound's coming from everywhere. So how do we do that? Well, we've developed a tool uh, with which we can identify, locate uh, the sound sources and put a little dot on it uh, in post-processing. So that requires us to have a camera and uh, three or four hydrophones uh, in a fixed position. And with that system, we can then uh, triangulate and overlay it. So it's important that it's all synchronized and we can overlay it on the video. And what you see here on the screen is an example of that that was um, uh, recorded in the Bahamas uh, uh, under the Wild Dolphin Project where I was out there and uh, we were recording the animals there. Um, so this is an older system. So we have, you, you see here the video screen and on the bottom you see the time series of the sounds that uh, were recorded on the side you see a waterfall. So there's clicks happening. But if you just heard the clicks, you have no idea which animal uh, uh, is, is vocalizing and clicking here to find food. And if we process that, um, we can run the clip now, then we'll see what the animals are doing. And you see wow. the red dots here. And you know exactly which animals are actually getting. So this allows us then to pinpoint who is talking, not just for clicks, also for whistles or for other so uh, sounds. So particularly for, let's say animals, um, if you have a group of 50 animals, um, how do you know who was just vocalizing what was going on? It's like a cacophony of sound. Everything is happening around you. And and it's very hard to follow the behaviors and figure out who was talking at what time. And with this system, we can now do that. Um, now, I just want to quickly also introduce the second part of the work where we're also using an array of hydrophones. Only this time, we're recording long term and without a camera. So this is a bottom mounted array where we put it in with an anchor um, at, say, 30 meters depth or thereabouts. And the system just sits there in the water column. And it has three hydrophones that are uh, at a fixed distance of about 50 centimeters. And we can then triangulate where sounds are coming from. If we put several of these units in, we can locate exactly where sounds are coming from. So now we know uh, patterns, for example, overnight, if they're, if they're coming into feed, if they're going into a certain bay, mm -hmm. any vocalization, any boat noise, anything that's there can be traced back to where it was coming from and we can then put that on top of a map eventually in post processing. So these units can stay in for several days depending on what schedule you set up for recording. So we have currently, um, we have to have two in, in Maui and we'll, we're going to be putting in today another two here on the big island. Yeah, and we, you know, you can obviously hear that this new technology comes with its own set of challenges, right? And But we have had already successful deployments. Last week um, in off the coast of Lanai, we actually had some successful um, in encounters where uh, part of our team was able to get these devices in the water and get some recordings of spinner dolphins, a very common species that's found in Hawaiian waters. And I believe, like, could you tell us a little bit about what was going on when we were able to capture um, this clip? Well, yeah. Um, so when we were capturing this clip, this was uh, just outside a little boat harbor, and we were just in the boat harbor, and all of a sudden we realized the dolphins were there. We observed their behavior for a while, seeing how they would react uh, to us, and then uh, I went in the in the water with uh, the handheld array, so with the camera, and we're just observing them, just basically seeing what's happening. So here you see me going into the water, wow. and here you see some dolphins. So at the beginning, we thought it was about uh, 40 animals or thereabout, and then it turned out to be around 100 eventually, so a larger group of spinner dolphins. And you see here that in groups of two to three animals um, just kind of hanging around. And, and Oh, and you can hear the vocalizations. Yes. And we were able to successfully record those, weren't we? Yes. 
So we haven't processed that yet. So that's completely new data. And we're still uh, recording and we need to, you know, the, the processing will take some time. But eventually, we hope that we will be able to identify which of these animals was vocalizing at what time. For example, was it a mother calf? What, uh, what vocalizations can we attribute to the mother? Which ones to the calf? You hear some clicks here. Oh, absolutely. I think we have an audience question coming in. Did the microphones and the arrays that we're using ever get disturbed by curious animals? Um, you mean the bottom mounted ones? Or the handheld? The handheld, I've had actually, in the Bahamas, <laughs> I had a dolphin come up and start rubbing uh, on the microphone. So that was quite interesting. So yes, you can get some disturbance. And of course, with the bottom mounted, we don't have a camera, we don't know. But it's possible they may just check it out and see what's happening. Is it a little chaotic when you're in the water trying to get all this data at once? <laughs> yes, because you don't know where, where you're looking first and you know which direction. And the animals come sometimes from behind you and they can shock you. You're actually swimming there with the array in the water and all of a sudden something zooms past you and it, oh, there's it all to me, <laughs> right, coming, from, coming right through here. So obviously we're trying to answer a lot of scientific research questions while we're out in these waters, but how are we actually going to be doing that? So I want to bring in another team member who's down in the wet lab, ready to show you all about the technology that Matthias described. So Abel is a research engineer at the Acoustic Research Laboratory at the National University of Singapore, and he specializes in marine acoustics and specializes in synchronizing this video and audio. So, hey, Abel, let's learn a little bit more about the research tools that we have been using that Matthias just described. I see you've got a lot around you right there. Hi, yeah, I am Abel. I'm the engineer of the team. So yeah, this is the wet lab where we bring the equipment in and out. Yeah, so this is one of our smallest array. Yeah, you can see there's one, two, three hydrophone here and one camera. And then we have a medium sized array and a large array. Wow. So the largest, yeah, so the largest one is have the hydrophone around 120 cm apart. And then this is 60 cm and this is 14 cm. So the smaller one uh, mainly meant for dolphins with higher frequency and shorter wavelength of their vocalization. And the bigger ones are meant for whales. Yeah, and you can see the camera is here. Yeah. Awesome, and is it, is it hard maintaining all this equipment to be waterproof, but still you know, transmit that data that we've been um, searching for? Yeah, there can be difficulties, but yeah, we have been working with this for some time and yeah, there are some trial and tribulations, but so far, so good this time. Yeah. How do you decide which one of these arrays that we're all looking at um, to use? I know that, you know, when we were uh, collecting research earlier this week, you chose the handheld one. Was it just because it was simpler and smaller? Yeah, so the smaller array has smaller distance between the hydrophone. So that is better for high frequency sounds. Yeah, so that uh, dolphins smaller animal dolphin tend to produce high frequency sounds yeah so then we'll use a smaller array Amazing. when we have humpback wheels then we'll try to use this bigger array yeah because of the lower frequencies and for those who are listening that might have you know the same types of interest in engineering um, that you do what was the most challenging part of designing a system like this with matias um a lot of testing because yeah when we see the dolphins usually we have like maybe 10 minutes or half an hour and it has to work so there's no time for any error so yeah a lot of testing to ensure that everything is fine yeah and then also convenient to use yeah so if it's too big and if it's not if it doesn't it's, if it's not easy to swim it's difficult yeah so yeah yeah you do weightlifting with some of these equipments so, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's getting in and out of the water with whales with the bigger ray um you're really dead at the end of the day <laughs> yeah absolutely well that's an exciting role that you have able and i know that we couldn't do what what we're trying to do without you so thanks for describing a little bit about um, the technology that we're using and um I know that you know we're we're in the water with these big arrays, these huge devices. We're trying to get these recordings, but there's a lot more in, uh, going on above the water by the research team on the boat. Um, in addition to getting information about the soundscape, we want to know that who we are studying specifically, um, so that we can better care for these individuals. So. Um, 
we're going to be talking about who's been doing that on the expedition. You know, I'm going to bring in one more teammate, Dr. Adam Pack. Adam Pack is based out of Hilo um, on Hawaii Island and holds two positions in psychology and biology at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. Um, he spearheaded several university initiatives, including the development of the Marine Mammal Research Laboratory and the Dolphin Institute, a Hawaii-based nonprofit. Adam, can you tell us a little bit about the work that's being done above water while Matias and Abel are getting those acoustics recording? And how are we identifying which individual um, dolphins or whales are that we're looking at when we're in the field? Aloha, Kako. It's good to be here and addressing everybody. Uh, I was on the ship a couple of days ago, but I had to return to Hilo, Hawaii, where I'm teaching my classes uh, in psychology and biology. So aboard the vessel, while everything's going on underwater, we've got cameras with long lenses. And the idea is that we want to get profile shots of the dolphins that we see because the dorsal fin, the, including the shape and nicks in the back of that uh, edge of the dorsal fin are unique to each dolphin. And so it's like your, their fingerprint identifying each animal. And so what we do <clears throat> on the boat in air is we get uh, fin photographs of every single dolphin. And then we look back into our catalog, which is shared with other research groups. And we're trying to understand who we're seeing. Are we seeing a male? Are we seeing a female? Is this a mother and a calf? And also, if we can match these photographs to previous ones, we can start learning about the life histories of these individuals. So the idea is that we want to know that who is who within the community and then pair that nicely with the, what we're hearing underwater. And what you're seeing right now is the tail flukes of uh, one of our most precious researchers in Hawaii, uh, the North Pacific humpback whale. Hawaii is the principal wintering grounds for these whales. And the underside of the tail flukes, like you see here, have unique patterns of white and black, and also the trailing edge is unique to each whale. The upper photograph is a whale that was photographed in the feeding grounds of Alaska in Lynn Canal by Chuck Jaraz, one of the pioneers, back in 1972. And in 2015, uh, my colleague uh, Jim Namens and I, aboard the Northern Song, which is where we do research, photographed this same whale many, many years later. At that time, this was the longest reciting of any whale in the world. That was over 40 wow. years. And ironically, this whale was just sighted this past summer, making it a 50 plus year old whale. Again, the longest recite in the world. So there's a lot we can learn by identifying individuals. It is really the heart of all we know about behavioral ecology of whales and dolphins. That's incredible, Adam. And you can definitely tell those photos were captured 40 years apart um, from the grain of it. Uh, when you were joining with us last week, you were such an instrumental part of our team. And, um, you know, you and Matias have worked together for many decades. But when it comes to capturing a good photo ID image, what are some tips that you have for those of us with cameras on boats that, you know, may be on whale watching boats? What what are you trying to capture? Do you have any, you know, aspiring um, photographers in the audience um, what would you tell them? Sure. Well, what you've got to do is you want to have a fast shutter speed and you want to have a lens that's at least uh, 100 to 300 millimeters in length or 400 or more is even better because you really need to get a zoom picture of that fluke. So you really get all those nooks and crannies of the dorsal fins, which you won't need a so side profile on. And of the tail fluke, you want to be behind the whale. And as it flukes up, then you want to capture that full image of the tail. And I'll just let you in on this awesome new technology tool that's just been developed by a fellow called Ted Cheeseman. It's called Happy Whale, which sounds very happy. And us researchers are very happy because those two photographs, initially, we would have had to match them by eye going through thousands, which can take years to do. But now Happy Whale is new technology that basically is an image recognition and processing program. It's online, you can find it online. 
All you do is you join with your email, you can upload a photograph into Happy Whale, and it automatically spits out for you the life history of that whale if it's been seen before, which is fantastic. It's speeding up everything that we can do to learn about these animals. And we're in the process with Ted of developing a, a, an analogous system for dorsal fins of dolphins. Awesome. I, you know, we have an audience question coming in that you are the perfect person to answer this question. Did these fluke prints or fingerprints, um, do they change a lot over time? How do you account for new scars and scratches? I know that we saw a calf uh, last week, but what over time, how do you account for that? So when a, for humpback whales, when a calf is born, it's fluke, if it flukes up, is quite milky. So that pattern that you saw, with like old timer is the name we gave to that whale, that humpback whale, that sets in at about one or one and a half years of age. And that the principal pattern and the trailing edge is going to be there for the lifetime of that animal. You can see that there are a couple of extra nicks and scars on there. And so, yes, over time, the whale will basically, or the dolphin through its dorsal fin might have a couple of new uh, scratches or uh, divots in it. But the main patterns of both whales and dolphins remain faithful to that animal and provides enough information for us to match them uh, reliably over time. So yes, they acquire some new scars, but that doesn't deter us from being able to match them over in this case with old timer, five decades. Amazing. And based off of, and Matthias, this might be a good question for you. Are whales and dolphins friendly towards each other? And Adam, maybe you could answer too, since you both have had unique experiences together and apart with cetaceans. Well, I guess that depends on which species. Uh, there are some bullies. <laughs> they obviously, they're all, they're all predators, um, except for the, the Belian whales. But um, We've had orcas go after dolphins. Uh, we have bottlenose dolphins attacking uh, harbor porpoises. So it's not always friendly, uh, but most of the times they just hang out. There's even babysitting happening sometimes between, say, spotted dolphins and uh, bottlenose dolphins. So yeah. there's a whole array of different behaviors that you can observe, but it's not just all uh, happy. Uh, yeah, all the time. It's, they have you know, roller coaster of emotions the same way yeah. humans do. Um, and uh, Adam, what about populations? We had a question come in about populations around Hawaii. Is there a specific species that you might be able to talk about how the population has declined or increased over time based on, you know, your decades of research in the region? Sure. I'll just pick one, the humpback whale, because it's the principal wintering grounds down here. So way back in the 1970s, when Matthias' mentor and mine were doing the first aerial surveys of Lou Herman, doing the first aerial surveys for these whales, counting them and finding about their distribution. They estimated between 500 and 800 whales left. Now, remember, this commercial, 20th century commercial whaling took place through the first six decades of the, uh, tw of the 20th century. So all the way up to 1966 until the North Pacific population was protected by the International Whaling Commission. So 500 to 800 animals, between 2004 and 2006, we, as well as 50 other research groups, participated in a program called SPLASH to basically learn about the abundance of humpback whales in the North Pacific and in Hawaii. And based on that, in 2006, there were over 10,000 humpbacks now in these islands. That is a remarkable recovery and, and grateful to all the people who became fans of humpback whales, insisted on legislation to protect them, and all the measures that took place, including the Marine Mammal Protection Act in the 1970s, to help these whales out. Incredible. Um, and we I did have a question about, you know, we had the amazing Sharks team come and do a live show earlier this week, and they talked a little bit about the AI technology. And we had a question come in about if AI technology can be used for cetaceans. And I just want to flag that Happy Whale, um, the platform that Adam spoke about, is using AI technology. Um, do you know exactly how that works, Adam? Um, it's basically... Um... Uh, open source code that has been modified now with a lot of us help to um, to kind of refine and get uh, more and more and more precise. So right now the AI is allowing, you know, between I would say the high 80s or 90s in terms of percentage of accuracy. When you put a fluke into Happy Whale, 
you'll get several out and you'll be asked, does this look like a match? So it's going to give you, you know, a few options. And, but in all the flukes I put in, they're all matches. <laughs> so the technology <laughs> is great. And it's amazing because just like with facial recognition AI, you can have the fluke slightly off center and it still can recognize it. So it's amazing. Amazing. So it seems like the technology that we have is really, um, set up for success, at least the best we can. Abel, I want to go back to you and we can talk a little bit about some of the names of the tools about that you've you know, engineered to be part of this array. So um, why don't you choose, I guess this might be a hard question for you. Why don't you choose your favorite and give us a little bit of a breakdown um, of the parts of the device uh, for the general public that it might be curious about just how much these work and um, you know, how you were inspired to engineer them in the first place. Um, okay, so we have a name for this. Uh, this is yellow and black, so we call it Bumblebee. <laughs> yeah, and this has blue and orange. Yeah, so we call it Bluey. Yeah, so for different sizes, we have different name. Yeah. This one we call it Sport with the older name. And a lot of, um, you know, a lot of viewers that are tuning into these shows, they have a common question, and that's always, how did you get into this work? How did you end up studying dolphins and building these apparatuses and, you know, using engineering to, to create the things that we're looking at right now? You have kind of a unique story. Would you be comfortable sharing a little bit about it? Yeah. So I studied physics. I'm majoring in physics. So I'm interested in science, technology, and everything. Yeah, then at the same time, I'm interested in music. Yeah, then I learned some music in university, studying computer music, yeah, acoustics and everything. Yeah, when I was looking for a job, yeah, I just Google acoustics and I found this lab <laughs> and they are doing dolphin acoustics. Yeah, looks really interesting. I get to go outdoor as well, which I really like. Yeah, and that's how I end up here. Yeah. It's, it's a beautiful story to show that your passions for music have merged with innovative research, right? And um, that's something that I think hopefully everyone can relate to that the things that you might have loved when you were little, like um, like music can help inform some of the work you do later. And then 10 years later, here you and Matthias are aboard the Nautilus um, on the frontier of a lot of this research. That's so exciting. Um, Matthias, I have a question for you. What are you most excited about when it comes to the outcome of this research? And I know how excited you are about this, so you're just gonna have to choose one. Um, and then we can tie it back in with a Nautilus. Well, I think what I'm most excited about is really identifying who is vocalizing, because this will open a door to so much new research where we don't really know what's going on. And if we want to learn this, if we want to protect these species, we need to understand them. So I think that is really the key, uh, the key that stands out for me. I'm like, yes, I want, I want to be able to figure out, ah, you know, this one was vocalizing. Ah, look, the cap is responding. So that back and forth, yeah, that interaction. Uh, is is amazing. It's it's step one into entering yes. communication, which I know you are so passionate about. And the Nautilus has also um, had their own stories with cetaceans um, on their adventures. JB, uh, I know you focus on, the, or Nautilus focuses on deep sea habitats, but you've had a chance to witness cetaceans too as well, right? Yes, um, we have seen some cetaceans in our travels. And there's one video that we're especially proud of. Um, we're gonna show it right here. This was a fantastic, spectacular encounter that our team had a few years ago um, off the coast of the Gulf of Mexico near Louisiana. Um, we were diving with ROV Hercules, conducting a midwater survey almost 2000 feet below the surface. And then this sperm whale was curious enough to come up and kind of investigate Hercules and um, definitely caused quite a stir in the control van, everyone who was watching, because um, as I'm sure you can guess, it's not very common to see these guys, especially not when you're down deep, um, because as we know, sperm whales are known for their ability to dive quite deep. So Matthias, my question to you is, how much do we know about their communication abilities and how it differs from that of the other whales and dolphin species that it might be easier to study because they're found closer to the surface? Well, sperm whales um, communicate, they're quite different from the rest of the, uh, the animals because, you know, for dolphins, you have whistles and, and clicks and, uh, and for sperm whales, they're really just using clicks. So there's no whistles really that the sperm whales have rather than they have what's called codas. So this is it's basically a rhythm-based communication system. 
And of course, there it would be really, really important not just to hear all the clicks, because again, let's say you have five or six sperm whales there and they're somehow clicking at each other and they're communicating. You have no idea which sperm whale was just communicating. So if we can capture that and we can identify which of the sperm whales was clicking at what time, then you can find out the rhythm, the exact rhythm. If you have the rhythm, you can then assign meaning to that or at least identity of uh, that sperm whale, right? So, you, you know, if you're looking at a, at a recording, you just have clicks everywhere. Oh, wow. And so with these, you know, was Hercules okay, Jamie, when the sperm whale came a little bit too close to him? Yeah, Hercules was fine. And, you know, the sperm whale was very gentle, just curious, just investigating. It was a very sweet moment of coexistence. Awesome. Yeah, I think uh, we would all be privileged to be able to share any type of environment with sperm whales. Um, Matthias, do you have, when you think about the encounters that you had the privilege to participate in through your research, um, at the frontier of this, this this knowledge of discovery, what what is your favorite? Um, I would say my favorite was when I was in with the humpback whales here in Hawaii a couple of years ago. Um, we were diving on a rebreather dive, and you 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 come down, and here's this humpback whale eye that is about this you know bigger than my head, and he's looking at me, and I'm looking at him, <laughs> and I was like, "What are you doing here?" So that was. <laughs> You know, he, he was looking at me and then he kept singing and that was an amazing encounter. I mean, this is this is like a submarine coming at you. It's huge. These animals are just amazing. So that was probably my most memorable. Event. Yeah. Is there is there a likelihood of seeing sperm whales in Hawaiian waters based on there your is. knowledge? Although not between the islands, a little bit offshore. So okay. We, it's possible that we might encounter sperm whales. Yeah, they might be a little bit deep with um, the ROVs like we have aboard the Nautilus. Um, we have uh, a handful of questions about Hawaii humpback whales. And since you just brought it up, I figured we might as well dive into them. So humpback whales are, are so unique. And um, we have Adam here who has had the privilege of studying them for decades. And one of the questions, Adam, we have is, uh, are songs passed down to the next generation by the parent? What do we know about humpback whale songs? And um, could you give a little bit of background for those listening that might not even know that humpback whales sing at all? Sure, I'm happy to do that. So uh, it's the males who sing. Uh, humpback whales, females do not sing. And humpback whale song is one of the most, other than human language, is one of the most complex communication systems that we know of in the animal kingdom. Its complexity is because uh, uh, the whales have uh, units which are organized into phrases and then themes that are different from each other. And the themes are structured and presented by the whale in a very particular order before it comes up to breathe, dives, and then continues on right from the beginning. So at any time when you put your head in the water during the uh, height of humpback whale season in Hawaii, you will hear a cacophony of humpback whale song because they're all singing at different parts of the song. And yet the males are actually listening to each other because uh, the song, at the beginning of the season will be slightly, uh, at the end of the season will be slightly different than the beginning. So the song evolves over time. The males are listening to the various evolutions within the song and copying those. So over years, so humpback whale song will evolve. And, uh, and this is on all oceans that we've seen this. Uh, there was another question about at what age do humpback whale calves start singing? So we actually, developed a sizing system before drones were ever part of the technology sphere. And this was using a video camera, we called it underwater videogrammetry, and we actually measured the length, the body lengths of humpback whales at sea and discovered that immature whales, uh, about 18% of them are singers. So calves probably don't sing, of uh, yearlings don't sing, but after that, we have a pretty good feel that uh, once the animals three, four, or five, the males will start singing. And so they're contributing to this large uh, soundscape of humpback whale song, which can uh, attract females to an area because the females have the large investment in the, in the future calves. And so they want to be able to choose among a lot of males that are potential suitors. Wow, so humpback whale song is a really key part of how 
these the species makes a living and uh, ultimately survives and persists. Um, what would happen if you know we had that that sound was drowned out? Could you talk a little bit about what are the threats to the underwater soundscape um, that we call noise pollution and um, how that could implicate um, the survival behaviors of humpback whales, but also the dolphins that are the focus of our research here? Sure. So, as Matthias. Uh, articulated before, for dolphins and for whales, sound is like the lifeblood. This is how these animals are communicating with each other. And there are critical stages between mothers and calves, whether it's whales or whether it's smaller dolphin species. That communication is essential for learning. It's eventually essential for what we call recruitment into the mating population so that these animals thrive. So you can imagine uh, how important a quiet ocean is to a, a successful communication. And yet we know that over time, over the 20th century and into the 21st century, uh, underwater noise pollution uh, related to man-made activities has actually increased over time. So one of the important things about the research that we are doing right now on this project, this collaborative project, is we're trying to learn the fundamentals about what's really important for dolphin communication and whale communication between animals. Once we have set that plate, once we have set that foundation, then we are in a better position to model what happens when all this underwater noise uh, from uh, boats, from seismic surveys, from a variety of different factors uh, is put into the ocean. Is it disturbing it? Is it within the overlapping the frequencies of the critical vocalizations of these animals. That's what we're trying to find out so we can better help these whales and dolphins. Awesome. And I think that if for those of you who are in the audience and are curious about what this sounds like to cetaceans when a busy um, ship comes in the area, I think that we have an example so that you can help visualize, you know, if you're trying to, to communicate or vocalize underwater, um, this is what it would sound like. So you can see how that could be um, a loud enough noise that would be able to drown out anything that you were trying to get to your neighbors uh, or other members in your pod. Uh, how can we, Matthias, this is a question for you, how can we conserve the underwater soundscape um, as individuals? I know that's a challenging question. We're still uncovering a lot of information about noise pollution, but um, what could someone do or what could we do as um, you know, the engineers of the world? Well, for one, of course, you can... Uh, not rev the engine and race around like crazy. Uh, right, boating speed. Boating speed is definitely a, a, a big, big impact and changes a lot. And there's under development now new engines that are much more quieter. So eventually, of course, they will replace because they're also more efficient. They will replace. Uh, you know, we can't cut off shipping completely. That is not going to work. Yeah. So how do we do that? Well, um, there is engines under development that are that are much, much more quiet. That don't have cavitation. So we're learning a lot on the physics and on. Uh, on uh, the sound production in these engines, uh, we measure that and then see if we can make it quieter. Yeah, quieter engines, ship speeds are all things that, you know, boaters can do to participate in quieter oceans. Um, so thank you for that. And it's wonderful to, to feel like there's a spotlight going on these understudied and, and sometimes un under misunderstood threats to the ocean. Um, for those listening that are extremely inspired by all of you and the work that you're doing, um, where what advice would you give for someone who wants to do something like this? Um, why don't we start with you, Matthias? Hmm. Well, <laughs> you know, when I was studying biology, everybody said, oh, you know, there's no jobs in biology. Uh, but I, you know, didn't get discouraged by that. I just kept doing it because I was, I really loved what, what that was and I wanted to do it. And uh, I think important is not to just follow your dreams, just go for it and do it anyway. You'll, there's a way somewhere you'll find something where you can find yourself a niche and you get a job in that, in that area and you can work in that field. Absolutely. Adam, does anything come to mind for you? Sure. I would say uh, if you, when you are young and for those who are parents out there, encourage your kids to get applied learning experiences. So for me, I'm was born and raised in New York and 
Uh, I got involved in high school in uh, marine science expeditions through a program called Earthwatch out of Massachusetts. They sponsor research expeditions all over the world. And so one of my first expeditions was with a bunch of high school students studying horseshoe crabs in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Then I flew out to Hawaii and I was studying little mollusks called nudibranchs around Oahu, diving for them. And eventually uh, this led to uh, an internship at uh, this dolphin lab that was studying dolphin cognition and language abilities. That's the same place where I met Matthias years later. He was one of my interns, actually, a very young Matthias. And so um, all those early experiences are so critical, right, to deciding what your passion is and what you want to pursue for your dream, for your job. Nothing is out of the realm of possibilities. Just give yourself the opportunity to experience different things in life. Those are great, great sound bites. And then Abel, for you, what would you share for the next generation of marine engineers and scientists? What's your What's your piece of advice? Um, yeah, nowadays technology is moving really fast. Things are changing and yeah, advancing a lot. So yeah, keep up to date and learn what is current. And then yeah, see what you're interested. Work hard, work smart. Yeah. Yeah, we need we need innovators like you on board these teams um, if we're going to be sitting at the frontier of research. So, um, and just for one last question to to keep to keep the curiosity high with the OET, if you could go on an OET expedition to anywhere in the world, just one place, what would you choose? And um, why don't we why don't we start with you, Abel? Where would you choose if you could um, if you could take the Nautilus anywhere in the world? And what would you study? <laughs> Pacific Ocean, yeah, that is one of the biggest ocean in the world. Yeah, so well, we're here. <laughs> we we're here. Where there's clear water. And would you study dolphin vocalizations, or were you, would you study a different element of the ocean? Uh, dolphins and whales. So whichever that comes by, hopefully all of them come, <laughs> and we'll see them and see what they do in the middle of the ocean and even deep underwater. Yeah, where we have very little flotation acoustics. That would be nice. Well, it seems like you're right where you belong then. Um, and Adam, what about you? If you could take a research expedition anywhere in the world, where would you go and what would you study? I would actually take it to the Arabian Sea because that is the only uh, humpback whale population that does not migrate between low latitude warm waters and uh, cold latitude oh high elevation. And so I'm really curious about uh, what is the behavioral ecology and the communication systems of a, of a humpback whale species that basically remains in the same areas year round? That is fascinating to me. Plus, it would be a great place to go to. What about you, Matthias? Well, uh, there would be a lot of places I would take it to. <laughs> <laughs> um, since, you know, I, I would love to go to Antarctica. Uh, oh, that, was gonna be that, nice. that would be amazing. Uh, and sound can be used in so many ways in this area just for one, of course, you have the whales that are feeding there uh, you know, because it's nutrient rich, but also uh, cl uh, climate change and global warming. Uh, our lab in Singapore has been working on a project with Scripps on recording through sound uh, the melting of the glaciers so that you can you can measure that because it's very hard to get to the, to the carving glacier. So with sound, you can do that too. So there's lots of possibilities of um, implying, applying sound there. I know. I um, the going seeing that that ecosystem up close and personal would be a gift. And, and what about you, Jamie? Do you have something that comes to mind when it comes to, you know, I know you've been with the Nautilus for a while now, but do you go anywhere in the world? Yeah, oh, there's so many good choices. But now that we've been talking about marine mammals, I would love to do some work uh, with the orca whale population in the Pacific Northwest. And I especially think it's fascinating the the kind of dividing between the transients and the resident whales. And I wonder if that is reflected in their communication and that if any of this technology could be used to study something like that, I would be really interested in. Amazing. And I think if I had to choose, that's a, that's a really great one, Jamie, because I think the ecotypes that are found in that region are so fascinating and there's so much left to understand about them, especially for, um, you know, the Southern residents, which are extremely endangered. But I think I would want to go to the Arctic just because of what Matthias mentioned about, you know, with the climate emergency and the way that that ecosystem is rapidly changing, being able to look at the behavior of um, animals and how it's being um, 
influenced by the the changing climate in that region so that as you can see we have had a ton of questions thank you for your curiosity and um, this collaboration between national geographic and oet aboard the nautilus is definitely going to have some big implications for marine mammals and hopefully discoveries uh, fingers crossed but this is also that we can but we can better understand these animals, but also the ecosystems that they rely on and our connected oceans. So um, thank you for spending the last hour with us and our marine mammal team. We've still got a week ahead of us when it comes to collecting information. So um, yeah, we're just really lucky to be here. And uh, if you wanna follow along on the expedition, you can definitely uh, look at Nautilus's socials. We've also got a field log being updated every single day about the work that we're doing. Um, yeah, Jamie, I really appreciate you making the, the time and hosting it for us. Thank you to the Marine Mammals team for sharing their passions with us, for sharing your research aboard EV Nautilus and beyond. Um, this From Short of the Abyss expedition has been a wonderful collaboration between National Geographic Society and Ocean Exploration Trust and is only going to get more wonderful. And thank you to all of our audience members for tuning in, for sticking with us through our technical difficulties, um, submitting your questions and your passions as well. If you want to rewatch this or any webinars that we've had, they will live forever on our website and our YouTube page. And if you want to tune into our next show, it will be Tuesday, September 27th at the same time. And we'll be talking to some scientists on board about how nature has always inspired design, uh, specifically for sharks and marine mammals. Um, and this is just another aspect of what we're studying and focusing on in our From Shore to the Abyss program. So don't forget to stay updated with us. Follow us on social media for behind the scenes. We're on Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and of course, NautilusLive.com. <laughs>